This is the Philosophical Angle, and I am your host, Chris Angler. I am the author of four books on philosophy, one of which is The Nature of Aesthetics. These books are available free for viewing online at www.philosophypublishing.com. Along with me is my discussant and panelist, Rick Samuelson. Rick graduated from Yale as an MBA from Wharton and an MA from Tufts. He is a retired investment banker. Welcome, Rick. Thank you. The purpose of the philosophical angle is to examine the nature of the concepts being used in current media and compare the essence of these concepts with the usage and circumstances in which the term is being used. This week, the subject of usage will be the recent Obama tax plan, where the administration has come out and said that they are willing to extend the Bush tax cuts. However, they would like to raise the taxes on high income earners in order for them to pay their fair share. The Republicans, on the other hand, have claimed a resistance to this. So let's see why they might claim a resistance, and let's see if it's good or bad. So first, let's go to our board, to our first chart, the Obama tax plan. Tax plan. Extend the Bush tax cuts, which are currently in effect until January of, the, of uh, this coming year. And secondly, they want to raise taxes on high income to pay their fair share. Okay. Well, what happens when you have taxation? In every single transaction, economic transaction, in, uh, anywhere in the world. Every person who's in the uh, transaction will sacrifice their risk, their information and knowledge, their time, their effort, and if there's material involved, their material also. And they sacrifice these ingredients in order to get a reward. That's natural. Everybody wants something that which is good, a reward, so they find sacrifice what they can to obtain that reward. And that's why you go to work. And at work, you sacrifice these, these variables, this risk, the risk of going to work, you sacrifice your time, your knowledge, and your effort in order to be able to produce a product and you have to produce a product that people want so that they'll exchange their things that they have also applied their risk uh, and their information and their, their time and their effort. So once the exchange happens and Goodness is transacted. You go to Walmart, you get some, uh, you pick up a, a TV set because you look to see that it provides some goodness to your life. Walmart provides the goodness of the TV because it perceives that there's a demand for it. So, and at, inside the store, there's an exchange. No different from going to the stock market, it down to the New York stock market, and purchasing some stock. The exchange is it's just a different type of exchange of goods. So in the midst of your sacrifice at work, you get a reward, but you're able to go out into the marketplace and purchase a TV set or toothpaste or whatever it is. <coughs> government comes along and takes part of that. 
and that will be the government reward. So the government is in society, and it also has a transaction with everybody in society. After all, society has decided that there is a need for a government. And so we contract with the, the government. That contract is known as a constitution. And that's how the government should behave, and outlines how the government should behave, and how the, uh, the, the people shall behave before the government, or with the government. So for this, for the existence of the government, it has to have some sort of means of support. So it extracts part of your reward that you got to work. And it, so the government takes its reward, and it expends it, and it spends it as it will, as it does. Quite a bit of it, actually. And some of those expenditures have produced goodness, uh, in the sense that a, a, it can increase the welfare and the goodness of society, uh, such as research. Um, this, uh, the space program gave you know, off a lot of uh, great things in society that we are now enjoying the benefit from. It also has non-producing uh, expenditures such as welfare, where there is no immediate reward. There is, on the other half, it's same as charity, it goes one half, and it could be uh, individual welfare, farm welfare, corporate welfare, there's plenty of types of things where government just kind of gives it out and gets nothing in exchange. But in the private sector, there's always an exchange, whether it's at Walmart or the stock market. One side has, has got their uh, sacrifices, and the other side has got their sacrifices. And you, from the sacrifice, you get reward, and then you exchange rewards, and you live your life. Here in the non-producing uh, welfare, there is no exchange. We're not going to go into how, what, what kind of welfare that's needed, but there are many types out there, and of course the government budget is immense. But with less taxation, let's follow, the, uh, let's follow our, our little roadmap here with less taxation. Again, we start with the, the, uh, our little equation, our little economic equation of of risk, information, time, effort, and material. And on the other side will be the same. We get a reward, we have an exchange. From that exchange, we have an efficiency. This efficiency comes from, often comes from, some sort of technological information, knowledge increase here that allows us to produce more reward for less effort. So we get a good, uh, so as, as more knowledge comes into the marketplace, greater efficiency, greater reward. And then from the reward, there are two types. One, there's a, our, our initial reward, which we need badly, of course. If we go to work and get a reward and get some money and get a payroll and Get, uh, 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 we do that because we need. We have some basic things we need to to establish in our lives. We need to eat. We need a house. We need uh, we need a roof over our heads, and and so we have our, our our consumption, our daily consumption. Once that's completed, you have some left over, and that's called the savings. A net percentage of that consumption is left over, and if it's left over, and you have a large enough reward, you can have a, something left over, and you can reinvest that. And when you, so really investment really is a derivative of our risk, information, time, and effort. It can also be called profit. So when companies get a little left over savings, we call it profit. When we, when an individual has it, we call it savings. 
You take a percentage of this. Company takes a percentage of this. And if we add in an efficiency, the government or the, the company expands. And when it expands, it needs, it creates an area which we can call jobs. And so this investment profit is controlled by your ideas. You know, you've got your savings and it's become uh, large enough so that you can think about what to do with it in the, uh, that might produce some more savings, a greater profit. And so that's the entrepreneur's purpose. So your reward, then you become an entrepreneur and either you just throw it in the savings bank or that's the stock market or whatever it is. Or you might get another idea to start a new company that produces another reward from the information knowledge that you have uh, sought. And you've got this idea, which is a piece of information, which is a piece of knowledge. And you take your investment and you create a company which creates jobs. And you do this because you've got a motivation. And that's, you, have, you want, you demand, you have a demand to increase your reward. Now, we increase our rewards because we know that it'll help our lives come up away from misery. So as we want to get to uplift our lives and become better and better off, that is good. And that's the nature of all good, to bring ourselves up away from misery. So with less taxation, we can get a bigger profit, which produces jobs. So now we get to the last part of this problem here. As we stated, the Obama tax plan has that second part called raising the taxes on high income to pay their fair share. Well, as we see, uh, the higher the income, the more they take from here, the less jobs you're going to have. However, now we've got another word here. We stated fair share. So what's fair? Fair is the execution of one's right to receive deliverance and deliverance of the obligations within a contract. So fairness equals a contract adherence. And we adhere to contracts because they're good. Because they enable cooperation with us in society. We can cooperate with others in society to produce more, to bring us up away from misery. And within a contract, there are rights and obligations. We have a right to receive and the obligation to deliver on both sides of the contract. The contract is good because it promotes societal cooperation and it maximizes goodness. And this is society's demand Society, when it went into contract with others in society and with government, it does so with only one thing in mind, to maximize societal goodness. And that is society's general demand. So we need to ask. We go back here and we decide, which does maximize societal goodness? <coughs> The Obama tax plan, or one with less taxation. I'd like to go to uh, my discussant and panelist now, and ask him to uh, see what he thinks. Rick, what do you think about the Obama tax plan? I think probably you're going to say that the Bush tax cuts should be kept. But the second part, 
about the high income earners having to pay more than they do now in order to affect, in order to keep the Bush tax rates, which really is kind of a contradiction because you really can't keep the Bush tax rates if you raise, uh, because if you raise one uh, uh, one section of that society uh, that had that enjoyed those rates, and now they uh, they have disappeared or will disappear. What do you think, Rick? Well, I'd like to focus initially on a, a few data points. My understanding is that if um, Obama went forward with his plan, he'd raise something like $70 billion, that's debatable because high income earners usually find, find a way around taxes. So, But let's assume that's correct, all right? Let's assume that his plan would raise an additional $70 billion, just for argument's sake. Well, you know, compared to a deficit of over a trillion dollars each year, you know, that's kind of a rounding error. So. The intention behind his tax policies clearly not to address the immediate issue, which is reducing the deficit. I mean, that's clear because it's not big enough and it's not important enough. And that's even on, based on their, you know, relatively optimistic predictions about how much tax income that, that they would earn. So I guess my first point would be uh, this is a polemical argument. This is grandstanding. This is, this is about appearing before the electorate to be uh, attacking wealthy individuals in some way, even if it's not relevant to addressing the current problems of today, at least in terms of rebalancing our budget. The other thing is that in the context of that argument, a number of commentators on the left uh, continue to attack uh, alternative budget plans, for example, Paul Ryan's, as leading to draconian cuts. But of course, cut in Washington parlance doesn't mean the same thing as a cut in uh, a normal human being's or a normal household parlance. All it means is a reduction in growth, right? When I cut an expense in my house, it means I don't pay for something or I don't, or I don't buy it. In the, gov in the government, of course, it means, well, I buy just a little bit less of what I was planning to buy in two years or one year or three years' time, even though the absolute amount is more. Right. So uh, all of that commentary is, of course, very misleading and, again, uh, focused on making the electorate believe that somehow their benefits or other privileges are in dollar terms or even in real dollar terms going to be reduced. Well, you know, none of that is, of course, true. Uh, as far as what taxes mean. And I would add, you know, another part of the Obama plan is to raise the dividend tax by something like three times, right? It's going to go from 15% to something like 45%. So there are other elements to the Obama plan that are going to raise taxes in, 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 uh, in other areas as well on top of all of this. Uh, I subscribe to what Milton Friedman said. Uh, there's no free lunch. You take money from one group of people and give it to another, it's actually net-net a negative for the economy because, because of the cost of administration, right, and the reduction in incentive. So if I take money from rich people and give it to poor people or give it to some other priority that the government views as valuable, uh, not only do I lose money in the process because of the cost of administering it, which is very, very expensive at the federal level, obviously, but I reduce the incentive of wealthy people to go out and invest in businesses. So it's net, net negative. Right. Now, you mentioned something about uh, cuts to the budget. 
uh, which are not really truly cuts, but they're just less increases in the future. Uh, isn't there a, what do they call, what do the politicians call this in their uh, parliaments? That, uh, I heard the word baseline budgeting. Is that, uh, is that what you're referring to? Yes. And uh, so really, the government can expand on baseline budgeting even without a budget, because it's written into the government uh, budgets that they will increase without having the Congress uh, even make a budget. Is that correct? Well, and, and the, the president has not submitted a, a budget, and you know, in years, right? Uh, and what is effectively happening is it's on autopilot. So uh, the latest estimate I saw is that the budget grows on autopilot at 4% a year, year in and year out, uh, without any uh, intervention. I think, you know, Ryan's plan calls for a growth in the budget of 3% a year, and this is viewed as somehow draconian. Would it not be great, would it not be a, a beneficial to hear from a candidate for the presidency to come forth and say and advocate the abolition of baseline budgeting? Would that be good for American society? Rick? I think it, it's potentially the most important change one could possibly institute at the government level. You're never going to get a budget, a balanced budget amendment to the Constitution, and it's probably not workable. But if they were to institute a different approach to budgeting, you know, zero-based budgeting, starting over every year, uh, the way a, a, a company does, by the way, right? Companies. Uh, zero out their budgets, or at least most companies that I've worked in, look at each line item and determine, well, do I need this department, or do, do I need this position, or do, do I need to expend money on this particular resource? And if I don't, I cut it out, or I reduce it. Uh, that's exactly the way the government should work. Right. I, uh, I agree with you. I think uh, it would be great to hear from a candidate out there to come forth with uh, uh, with the uh, uh, recommendation that we uh, into the uh, and take it into the uh, into the uh, convention uh, at both either the Democrat or the Republican uh, conventions coming up would be a great uh, a great thing for the uh, for the United States as it is now with even with baseline budgeting it seems like the United States could become the United States of Greece in the future. Is that, uh, is that a possibility? Right? Well, it, it may take a while, uh, but we're certainly heading in that direction, and who knows, in a few months' time we may have another debt downgrade. Uh, certainly there are rumblings along those lines. Uh, but one, one thing I find remarkable about government, and one thing that never gets discussed, is the efficiencies, right? Why is it that government needs to increase if technological efficiency should be helping us to reduce the number of persons involved in or administering within the government? Why is it that we get no efficiencies out of government? I mean, companies have to do it all the time, right? That's right. Uh, whether they outsource or they automate or whatever measures they take, uh, they live in a competitive environment, and therefore if one competitor does it, they have to follow suit. Otherwise, they become uncompetitive and they go out of business. This can't happen in the government uh, until they go bankrupt or fall, right? But there's never a discussion, either at the state or national level, of where the efficiency should arise uh, within government such that I should be able to do more with fewer people. Right. Uh, uh, you know, uh, back in the Eisenhower administration, one of the first things he did was to uh, 
with the government of uh, the uh, of the uh, of the company that was uh, created in the Roosevelt era in the 1930s, that the government started to uh, this government development corporation started to hold uh, and in, invest. In corporations and started to take them over and and take over part of the uh, private sector. The first one of the first things Eisenhower did was to abolish that and abolish everything else in the government that uh, could be uh, seen as competing with the private sector. And this led to a huge boom. Perhaps uh, we could get a candidate to come forth with that very idea, as uh, Rick has just mentioned, and. Uh, have uh, the, the, the government own, uh, have all the departments in the government, wherever it can be done by a private company, have it outsourced as such, instead of having it done in-house. Well, this in line with, uh, with uh, baseline budgeting certainly would be a, uh, a, a great thing for the uh, for the America, uh, for the for for America. Now, uh, any uh, last remarks? Uh, we have about one minute to go. Rick, uh, any last comments? Any last comments? Well, um, I'm very optimistic that uh, if Romney and and Paul Ryan prevail, uh, at least. There will be a different approach to the budgeting process, and I would lump Republicans and Democrats together in terms of embracing, certainly under George Bush, this notion that the government should grow ever larger, at least with Paul Ryan, even if there is uh, a built-in plan for growing the government, it's in line with a slower rate than the rate of economic growth that they're projecting. If we could only get to that notion that the government should grow, if it's going to grow at all, at a slower rate than economic growth, and if it doesn't, you cut it back. Okay. That well would said. be a great step forward. Okay, I agree. Well said. And uh, thank you for joining us at the Philosophical Angle, and we'll see you next time.